Okay. So uh, I'm Aaron Sinreich. I'm a media professor at Rutgers University. I have a long and storied past uh, talking about music and technology and researching uh, the places where they intersect. Um, I have written uh, two books. I'll be presenting from my new one, which is going to be released in the coming fall, called The Piracy Crusade. My first book was called Mashed Up. Um, it was about uh, mashup culture and how the kind of micro-level battles over music and technology and the ethics and aesthetics and, and laws surrounding it um, are really kind of a staging ground for the larger battles about the shape of society in the 21st century. Um, way in the before time, before I was in academia, I was uh, a, the head uh, music researcher and a, uh, a senior media analyst at the firm called Jupiter Communications, later Jupiter Research in New York which was kind of the epicenter of, uh, of the dot-com uh, consultancies during the late 90s and, and turn of the century. So I've been looking at this for many, and my clients then were the major labels and the major film studios. and um, I've been looking at this from many different angles for, for a long, long time. Um, so in many ways, this book is really kind of looping back to issues that I started to research back in 1999, 2000, and uh, I'm really only able to give this kind of 360 degree view into uh, having gone out of commercial research into the academy uh, and, and now combine those, those different schools of thought into, into one kind of meta argument. Right, right. Um, I know that with your, and I'll just chime in occasionally, um, your mashed up configurable culture <coughs> book, um, that a lot of that led into, I'm guessing, the development of the, hey. Hey. <laughs> Sorry, I went to the second okay. line. No, oh, that's okay. Um, glad you can join. So Me too. You weren't able to join the first time, right? No. Right, great. So great that you can be here. So this is Aram. Hi, Hello. how are you? Very nice to meet you. I've enjoyed your stuff. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. Um, so I think, what was I saying? Oh, yeah, the, the development of, of your first book, of Matchup, Matched Up and Configurable Culture, you sort of like touch a bit on the ideas of the authorship and the development of like um, the mashup culture and the blurring of the lines between um, author and producer and things like that. Did the work that you do there lead you to, to this, but much more um, depth and detail? And like, how did, it, how did it sort of come about? Yeah, no, it's very much, um, you know, the way that I've been looking at it, uh, the kind of larger project with a capital P is that there are really kind of three tiers of action, right? Um, and in each of those tiers, there are uh, major uh, battles going on for the future shape of society. Um, and, you know, if you want to be simplistic about it, which I don't, but, but for the sake of brevity, it's really about uh, the kind of, um, you know, uh, democratization of power versus the centralization of power in the form of, of uh, major social institutions. And obviously, it's, it's much more complex than that. But, so the three tiers are uh, cultural, and that's really what the first book was about. It was looking at the ways in which uh, struggles over the shapes of society are played out through cultural forms like mashups. This tier is more about the regulatory system, the, the laws, the policies that shape the way that culture can be produced and distributed and received. Um, and then there's the third level, which I've done some work on as well, but I haven't written that book yet. And that level is about the infrastructure itself and how the shape of the network really over-determines what kind of culture and what kind of policy can take place via okay. that network. So this is the next yeah. book, the book to come. <clears throat> well, I'm actually writing kind of, I'm, I'm going to work on level 2.5 next, okay. which, is, which is about the uh, the standards that connect the network to the culture. So looking at, for instance, where we, you know, how we decide, um, you know, what kind of video and audio formats we're going to use, how we take uh, the realm of the human senses and turn them into right. something that's machine-coded and, and standardizable. Right. And then I'm going to get down to the, um, to, the, to the network level and start tracing down all the, all the different... Uh, you know, infrastructural pathways. Nice, nice. Um, after that, I think I'm just going to go to religion, you know. <laughs> and, and on this stuff I mean, he would say this is one. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah well, what, um, don't you talk about that religion in your presentation? I do. I'll get to that yeah, okay, in, so in a little yeah, while. All right. Okay. So um, if you want to share your screen again. Okay, cool. 
Um, so I'm actually uh, not going to be showing the whole presentation, simply because uh, it's you know it's it's really it could take me three hours easily, and, and I've, I've done it in in more than two before. So I'm going to talk just about the book has three parts, and I'm going to talk through the second and third parts of it. The first part is really kind of historical. It's where did the music industry come from? Why do we have this interesting, bizarre thing called copyright? Why do we call certain things piracy? And what do they have to do with actual piracy that takes place on boats? Um, so I'm just going to kind of skip through all of that and sum it up by saying that um, you know the industry and copyright are not, you know, they're kind of treated as something that you know needs to happen, like God handed them down on a tablet and said, there must be a music industry, it must be worth X billion dollars, there must be copyright laws, um, we need this to happen. And as I point out, the reason that the industry and the laws are shaped the way they are is really more of kind of an accident of historical contingency than any kind of master plan. And the historical contingency has to do with who is powerful at what point in time and you know how they not only uh, pushed for the development of new technologies and new new um, revenue models, but also actively stood in the way of certain technologies and certain business models um, to prevent them from taking place. Um, so this section of the book, the middle section of the book, is really looking at um, the last 15 years and how the music industry has undergone these rapid economic changes and structural changes. And, you know, we're so accustomed to um, being able to point the finger at pirates and piracy and peer-to-peer -peer and kind of delving into that argument and looking at it uh, so close up that, that the mythologies can't really, um, you know, stand the light of day. Uh, so the first chapter in the section is called How Bad is P2P Anyway? And it, it looks at, um, you know, really the, the, the uh, definitive um, technology to enable so-called piracy, which is peer-to-peer -peer file sharing. And the music industry routinely, as in this quote from John Kennedy from the uh, IFPI, which is the International Federation of the Phonographic Industries, the, the major big kahuna trade group, says P2P is going to put the music industry out of business. And, you know, of course, on the face of it, P2P is not going to put out of business. It's, it's just a set of technologies. Um, mostly protocols like email or like instant messaging or like the web itself. It's just a way for some people to share information with other people. And you can say, well, yeah, right, that's true, but, you know, this is the real world and we all know that uh, P2P is actually this horrible dark alley where people, you know, trade bad things. Don't people actually use it specifically to hurt the music industry? Um, so I'd like to take a look at some of those assumptions that go into that. Mm -hmm. uh, and kind of address them one at a time. So the first assumption, you hear this claim all the time from the music industry, is that every time you download something from peer-to-peer, -peer, mm -hmm. you're causing, costing them a sale, right? They're losing the money that otherwise would have been spent um, by somebody to buy that thing that was downloaded for free. And this is just ridiculous on the face of it. As I've pointed out many times over the years, even if you just look at the music industry's own math, um, they, they, according to them, 95% of all music downloads are illegal. And, you know, I think that number is probably closer to 99.9, .9, but let's say for the sake of argument it's only 95. If you look at the fact that there were $7.5 billion in legal downloads last year, that means by their own math there must have been $142 billion in lost sales last year. Mm. But even at its peak, the, the industry was only a third that size. So how can they have lost three times more money in sales to P2P than they made across all their channels in the best year that they ever had, mm -hmm. right? It doesn't really stand up to the basic test of logic. And you could say, well, okay, that's fine, so maybe they're exaggerating a bit, but, you know, isn't it true that, you know, when you use P2P, you are diminishing revenues? I mean, after all, people are getting something for free that they should be paying for. Um, now, this is actually where my story began, was when I was an analyst at Jupiter back in the 90s, and the RIAA were my clients, Napster came out and I said, oh my god, you know, I have to see what the effect of this is going to be on the marketplace because that's, that's my job. So I fielded a massive survey and what I found out was that if you look at all of the people who use the internet for music and you put them into two, do you hear that in the background? It sounds like there's a, like a masked killer with a chainsaw or something. No. 
You guys don't hear that? I, I hear it, actually. Oh, I don't hear it. It must be coming from you, Jessica. Oh. Watch out! Sorry. He's in the house! <laughs> um, no wait, worries. Me, so anyway, so... About, wait, hold on. Ah, that's much better. Wait, wait. So what I found... Are you still there? I put Josephine on mute and... And, and it um, seems to have done the trick. Me or you or Josephine, so... You know what I think it was? I think it was a feedback loop. I think that Maybe. the audio from my presentation where it's going back through your mic. Yeah, hey, I, mean, I can't turn my mic off, though, because I'm recording, so that's unfortunate. Got but, it. Yeah. Don't worry about it. It's all good. Yeah, sorry. Um, so, uh, so what I found was if you look at all the people who use the Internet for music and you put them in two buckets, and those two buckets are identical in every way, same set of ages, same set of incomes, same set of usage patterns, same set of music fandom, and you, one bucket was people who had used file sharing in the last year, and the other was people who hadn't. The first bucket, those people were 45% more likely to have increased the amount of money they were spending on music in the previous year. And what we found over the past 13 years since I first fielded that research, it's been done dozens of times by researchers in and out of the academy, and there's the amazing thing is despite the fact that millions of dollars have been thrown at this question, there's no definitive answer. Um, it's basically a Rorschach test. You see in it what you want. The data has shown positive effects of file sharing, negative effects of file sharing, and neutral effects of file sharing. Um, and new research comes out every month or two that continues to, uh, to make it a more complicated and more confusing set of answers rather, rather than a, a consensus. There's been no emergent consensus. So much for that claim. Um, then there's the claim that, that you, know, you can tell the whole story just by looking at how much the music industry makes selling music. But the reality is that one of the things that's happened over the past decade is that they've actually massively diversified the revenue model. So there are all these new categories of revenues that are each worth a billion dollars or more that didn't exist for the record labels 10 years ago. So, for instance, they're now making over a billion dollars, it was 905 million in 2011, from internet radio and satellite radio royalties. Mm -hmm. They don't get royalties from AMFM. They only get royalties from digital radio because when mm -hmm. AMFM uh, was created, the record labels didn't have very much power. So they weren't able to get that into copyright law. That's kind of an example of what I was talking mm -hmm. about before. Um, so now they're making billions of dollars from that. Um, all these other categories, I don't have time to go into them in depth, but I do in, in my book in Chapter 5. And overall, if you look at third-party analyses, the music economy in the U.S. has gone up 16% in eight years, uh, and the entertainment economy overall has grown by half since 2000. So these are the file-sharing years, and the amount of money flowing into the economy due to uh, music and entertainment products has actually increased, not decreased. Um, then there's the claim, of course, that they're looking out for the artists and that the artists are the ones who are really getting hurt when you engage in so-called piracy. And there are all kinds of artists who have shown that you can actually thrive, not in spite of, but because of the free sharing of content online. So there was Radiohead's famous experiment where they asked you to pay what you wanted for uh, for their In Rainbows album, and uh, they actually made more money from that voluntary payment system than they had from their previous major label CD release. There was Prince, who twice now has put out uh, two recent albums, not in stores, but as a free insert in the Sunday newspaper in England. The first time he did that, he put out three million free CDs, and then uh, soon thereafter, he sold out 22 straight days at the London O2 Arena. He didn't even have to go on tour. And he made over $20 million um, just in one city in one month because he'd given away all of his CDs. And that's much more than he probably made from all of his royalties from all of his albums put together prior to that. Um, Sufjan Stevens, uh, the kind of indie rock darling, uh, who uh, recent EP, All Delighted People, uh, put it out on Bandcamp, which is usually used by indie musicians. And... Um, that is to say, non-label affiliated musicians. He put out one tweet, one Facebook post, and one email to his group, and he sold tens of thousands of copies over the weekend, even though it was freely streaming online. Uh, and then most recently, Amanda Palmer, who you might know of, who uh, she crowdsourced her new album and tour, and in one month, without having recorded a single note, she made 1.2 million dollars. Uh, just and just because people wanted to see what she would come out with. 
Um, then there's this guy, uh, Justin Bieber, JB. And, uh, you know, here's a classic example of just a, you know, a, a music industry juggernaut worth billions of dollars uh, who got his start by piracy, right? He was singing cover songs on YouTube, at, which is technically illegal and, and could have made him liable for hundreds of thousands of dollars in damages. And instead, they, uh, you know, they swooped down and, and made something out of it. Um, and he's not, you know, the only example. There's another great example that I love, which is this guy, Arnel Pineda, who uh, was uh, the lead singer of a Philippine cover band. He sang a bunch of songs by Journey, put it on YouTube, and again, instead of suing him, Journey decided to hire him as their new lead singer. And then they went on tour and made $35 million, and wow. they put out a new album, and it was their, the, the best hit album they'd had in decades. Um, so again, they could have just sued him, but they didn't. They decided to, you know, make use of his YouTube startup. Um, now, the RAAA still claims that when they are suing people, they do it to protect artists and to benefit everybody. But if you actually look at the economics, there's this guy, Donald Passman, who's actually written the book on music industry economics. And in a recent article, he demonstrated that for every thousand dollars that the music industry makes in, in, uh, in retail, the average musician gets $23. Mm. Um, and then Chuck D from uh, you know, Public Enemy found the same thing. He did an analysis and in court he, he uh, presented documents showing that even if you're just selling on iTunes, the artist makes about $80 for every thousand dollars sold on iTunes. Mm. Um, so, so much for P2P being the great um, threat to the music industry and to musicians. Let's talk about those numbers, though. We all know the famous chart. This is the way that it's usually presented. It was created uh, by an economist named um, Stanley Leibowitz. And he's the guy that the music industry always go to when they sue somebody. He's their expert witness. And because I've been an expert witness for the defense a bunch of times, I ended up going against him in court. And um, this is the chart that he shows. And his claim, this, is, this shows that the albums per, sold per person in the U.S., has gone up steadily from 1973 to uh, 2000, and it would have just kept going up and up and up and up. That is, you know, every five years people would have bought one more album per capita till eventually people were buying a hundred albums per capita or a thousand albums per capita. If it weren't for that rascally Napster that came along and reduced the number of albums sold per capita. Now he claims, and the music industry claims, that this is either that this is the definitive proof. This is the definitive proof that file sharing is either the primary cause or the only cause of the music industry's economic downturn. That's their claim. I'm just restating it. And obviously, you know, you could build charts all day. This is an actual chart of U.S. kerosene sales uh, over the past 20 years. And you can see kerosene sales were trending up. Uh, and then after Napster began, kerosene sales <laughs> went down. Now, nobody would say that this was de facto evidence that Napster is the primary cause of kerosene sales going down, but, um, you know, and we think this is silly, but it's really actually identical in terms of the logic that's being employed to this plan. Um, so the problem is that the true story is much more complicated and therefore doesn't really make for as good propaganda or news articles. Um, but to boil it down to its essence, the true story of why the music industry's uh, revenues from sales have changed so much over the past few decades is that there was a perfect bubble during the 1980s and 1990s followed by a perfect storm in the years since then. So let me talk about the perfect bubble. Number one, the years during which everybody, remember in like Men in Black when he shows them the new CD that's the size of a thumbnail and he's like, guess I'll have to buy the white album again? Mm -hmm. um, that's called the format replacement cycle. The music industry has been doing that for a century. Mm -hmm. Every 20 years they come out with a new format and everybody has to buy their white album again. And during the 19, late 80s to early 90s, uh, throughout the 90s, um, people were doing that more than ever. The CD, uh, you know, people were buying the white album on CD to replace their cassette, which replaced their LPs. Now, by 2000, anybody who had owned the white album on cassette had already bought it on CD. So that cycle naturally was going to end. But as you can see, and CDs, by the way, were about twice the cost of cassettes, right. which they replaced. So you can see that this tremendous ahistorical jump in the value of the industry happened exactly during that period. 
There's also the fact that where music got sold changed during those years. So it used to be all mom and pop kind of corner record stores. And then in the 1980s, Tower Records and Virgin and HMV took over. And that was actually really good for the industry because it created more shelf space and it created more hype around music buying and they got into every mall across the country. But then the problem was once they developed the kind of infrastructure for massive distribution of CDs, um, the so-called big box stores, the Walmarts and the, the Best Buys of the world, figured that they could sell CDs too. But the problem is that they marked the CDs down to nine dollars, nine ninety-nine, because they just wanted to get people in the door to buy TVs and stereos. They they didn't mind losing money or breaking even on the sale of CDs. So then that really scared the music industry, as you can see. Sales started to level off way before Napster happened in the mid 1990s because CDs were being marked down. So even though they were selling more of them, they were selling them at a lower price. So the music industry came up with this plan called MAP, Minimum Advertised Pricing. And what they said is, okay, Walmart, okay, Best Buy, um, if you guys sell CDs, we will help pay for the advertising. But you have to promise that you will only advertise them at the old price, at $15, no more $9.99 specials. So they agreed to do that, and that maintained the value of the industry for a couple of years. But then they found out that it was actually illegal. They got sued by the state attorneys general of many U.S. states and investigated by the Department of Justice, and they had to stop doing it. And you can see what happened after that. I'll get back to the later version of that in a little while. But first, I also want to point out that the 1990s were the longest period of economic expansion in U.S. history. And as, as you can see from the blue line, median household income, the amount of money that people had to spend on stuff, actually grew to unprecedented peaks during that decade. Now in the decade that followed, of course, we had recession and you saw median household income go down. Um, so these are all factors that contributed to this phenomenal growth in the value of the industry during the 1990s. Then comes the perfect storm, and the number one thing that happens is that um, CD replacement ends, right? You, I've got the White Album on CD. There's nothing to replace the CD, so I'm not going to buy the White Album again, right? That instantly is going to undermine the value of the industry, and major labels have actually admitted to this in their public filings, as you can see from this quote. Um, if you also look at the fact that, you know, when music moves online, um, people stop buying albums and they start buying singles. And the fact is, there's really only two or three singles per album that people want because the music industry has been stick filling them with so-called filler material for the past few decades. Um, so, you know, as Bob Pittman, who started MTV and now runs Clear Channel Radio, has said, when he talks to people in the industry, they say the biggest problem is that people are buying singles online rather than albums in the store. So it has nothing to do with piracy. It has to do with the simple fact that I'm buying three dollars worth of music instead of fifteen dollars worth of music. Um, then there's that gets complicated by the fact that after MAP, you can see that people stopped buying uh, music at the same price because they could no they they were no longer price fixing. So music went back down to nine dollars, and that tent pole started to sag. The problem there was that the brick and mortar stores, the Tower Records and the HMVs and the Virgins of the world. They couldn't compete at 9.99, so they all went out of business. They all went turned belly up in 2006, 2007. Um, so with fewer stores selling music, there was fewer music sold, and more and more people moved online, which accelerated the transition from albums to singles. So all of these different factors are interrelated to one another. Then there's the fact that when you look at the amount of money reported by the music industry, they're not reporting indie sales. They're not reporting music sold directly to consumers by bands. And the amount of money being paid by consumers directly to bands has climbed into the hundreds of millions or billions in recent years uh, because of these services like TuneCore and CD Baby and Reverb Nation and, and uh, you know, Bandcamp, which I mentioned before, each of which uh, gets tens or hundreds of millions of dollars in revenues passed on to the artists every year. It didn't exist ten years ago. So there's also a certain leeching. Money that consumers are spending that would have shown up in that graph uh, a decade ago is not showing up now because it's, it's not going through the major labels. Uh, it's going directly to the artists. Then there's the fact that during the 1990s, remember household incomes were going up, 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 up. All these new consumer categories came out to take advantage of that. Mobile wireless plans, mobile applications, 
um, next third generation video game consoles, DVDs and then Blu-ray, online subscription services. That, that bigger pie got cut into more slices. And then when the pie shrank again, music was still a smaller slice than it had been before the pie grew in the first place. So that wallet full of money is having to spread across a larger number of different items than it did before the economic expansion of the 1990s. So I want to talk about one more set of numbers that you may have heard about um, while I'm on the subject, and that's the subject of piracy estimates. So for instance, when, uh, when the Senate introduced a new bill this year called the Cybersecurity Act of 2012, which has all kinds of horrible provisions in it that would have um, diminished our civil liberties in a number of ways that I'll talk about later, part of the way that it was rationalized was as a way to prevent $250 billion a year lost to American companies in intellectual property theft. And that's directly from the website of Chuck Schumer, who was the sponsor of the bill. Now, he got that number, he cited that number to the RIAA, the Reporting Industry Association of America, which lobbied very heavily for the bill. Now, the RIAA got that number from a think tank called the Institute for Policy Innovation. Now, it's not really so much of an independent think tank as more of kind of a front for lobbying organization run by former Congressman Dick Armey. Dick Armey um, was, is what part of the so-called revolving door policy of people who leave Congress and immediately become professional uh, lobbyists who help divert money from the corporate sector into Congress uh, to win legislation that corporate would like to see. Um, now, he didn't make up that number either. They actually cited it to the OECD, which is a fairly reputable institution that represents the economic interests of mostly European nations. Now, the OECD used that number in a report that they cited to the United States Federal Trade Commission. The problem is that the FTC was contacted by, con by the uh, Government Accountability Office and the GAO said, where did you get that number? And the FTC said, we didn't. We have no idea where that number came from. We can't stand by it. We can't vouch for it. We don't know why it was cited back to us. Now, the GAO is actually part of Congress. <laughs> so Congress is using numbers debunked by Congress <laughs> as a rationale to create laws that hurt the American public. I find that very disturbing. Yeah, yeah. Now, let's, yeah, I mean, by the way, feel free to jump in at any point. Um, now, let's talk about what the music industry has done to hurt itself. As we've established, we can't say that P2P has hurt the industry. We can't say that piracy in general has hurt the industry. We can't even really say that the industry is necessarily hurting in any measurable way. But to the extent that it is, it's certainly done enough to dig its own grave. I mean, for a long time, the industry was very well known as, um, you know, a very shady place full of people who uh, cheated each other, robbed each other, were not very kind to one another. Um, they had a lot of chickens to come home to roost. I mean, if, for instance, if you look at a recent court case by a country music legend, Kenny Rogers, against Capitol Records, which is a major label, um, he's detailed the many, many ways in which they violated his contract, stole his money, um, didn't operate in good faith, didn't have fair dealing, um, and I, I, I reproduce a lot of that, uh, those accusations in my book, um, but, it's, but it's a matter of public, uh, public record. You can go online and find the court documents. And, you know, the, the, the basic story here is that, you know, these guys were like, you know, the only drug dealer in town. Basically, if you were addicted to music, as I confess to being, um, you had to do you know, business with the major labels. There was no other game in town. And therefore, they could get away with being as scummy as they wanted, just like the corner drug dealer. Um, and, you know, it wasn't just cheating artists. They actually cheated consumers in all kinds of ways. There was payola, where they were actually paying off radio stations to play music people didn't want to hear. Price fixing, like the map stuff I was talking about before. Album filler, as I was talking about before. And all these other kinds of ways that I don't really have time to get into that they accrued a lot of kind of bad blood with consumers. And once that, once consumers had somewhere else to go, why would they keep doing business with these people that had, uh, had created all this bad will? Then there was the fact that long before Napster, they were actually insulting music uh, purchasers by calling them 
by, by claiming that they were killing music. You know, I don't know if you, you don't look old enough to remember the 80s that well, but, yeah. but <laughs> I am. And, you know, I, I used I to still record. still have tapes. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> I dumped all of mine on a curb in, uh, I think, 2001. And a tape deck. So. <laughs> oh, wow. Well, all right then. Wow. So, so you remember recording the, the radio like I do. And, yeah. and you know, mm -hmm. this was an actual campaign by the music industry to tell us that not only were they hurting sales, they were actually killing music. We were killing music by recording music off of the, the radio. And, of course, we all know that that's patently absurd. Um, and, and, you know, again, if you compare it to another industry, um, you can see that the, the same argument makes no sense when you take it out of uh, the musical context. Um, but for some, not for some reason, because of a well-sustained propaganda campaign, they've actually done a very good job of convincing us that it's actually true. Now, here's the propaganda campaign that I'm speaking of in its most recent incarnation. If you look before 2002, very little news coverage of peer-to-peer -peer and online music used terms like illegal downloading or music piracy. That's just not the way that people thought of it, Gesundheit. And, you know, in fact, it wasn't technically illegal because there hadn't been any court cases about peer-to-peer -peer decided at that point. Now, they went on a very massive public awareness campaign where they dumped millions and millions of dollars into trying to change the debate. And as you can see, it had an instantaneous effect. Those terms started appearing very frequently in the news media by a factor of hundreds of percent increase. Now, when they pulled the money out of the campaign five years later, you can see that those numbers went back down. But they didn't go down to their original levels. And the reason is they had changed the way that people talk about this stuff. And now everybody uses But it's not because there's, there's nothing natural about us using these terms. This was orchestrated by a very well-funded propaganda campaign. And they still continue to tell us that we're evil and that we're the enemy in their advertisements. You can click, but you can't hide. This is from the film industry. Um, but it's an anti-P2P advertisement. And what they're basically saying is, we are surveilling you. Right? Your privacy is worth nothing compared to uh, our concerns about what you might be doing to our bottom line. And that is, continues to be a very damaging message to give consumers. Then, of course, is the fact that they've sued tens of thousands of Americans alone, including dead people, people who don't own computers. They, uh, they went into the Naval Academy as they were preparing to go to Iraq during final season and raided their rooms and took their computers um, because they were suspected of having uh, done peer-to-peer -peer file sharing. They even sued uh, a disabled veteran widow. And all of these court cases, only two of them have actually gone to court. All of them, tens of thousands, have been settled for somewhere in the range of three to five thousand dollars, often bankrupting families or putting them in financial straits. Now, in a recent interview, the head of the RAAA, Kerry Sherman, was asked, how do you feel about having sued grandmothers and, and grandchildren and, you know, some, some, pro, some, some people who, you know, are very sympathetic. And his response was, this is a verbatim quote, you know, we're feeling pretty good. No remorse, no concern for the PR effects. These people think that they're invulnerable. Um, then there's the really crazy stuff that they've done, like this poor company. This was uh, an up-and-coming uh, game software designer in the late 90s. The RAAA stormed into their offices, um, uh, brought them to court, sued them, it cost them tens of thousands of dollars to, to defend themselves. As it turns out, they hadn't done anything wrong. Mm. Someone who worked at their ISP had been storing his MP3s on, uh, on, on a server that the, I, the IP address was uh, you know, mostly used for Parsoft. And they ended up going out of business. Wow. And this has happened over and over and over again. This guy, um, Representative uh, Berman, Howard Berman, um, at the behest of the music industry, actually introduced a bill into Congress that would have made it legal if they suspected that you were downloading their content for them to hack into your computer, spy on you, and remotely disable your computer. It would have made that legal, the bill. Now, the bill didn't pass, but that didn't stop the industry from doing it anyway. A few years later, Sony BMG put out hundreds of millions, possibly billions, of CDs that had rootkit software on it which is what hackers use to gain control of your computer. 
And once a rootkit has been installed on your computer, it can't be uninstalled. Uh, and you can, your computer at the very, uh, all kinds of things can happen. Basically, it can break permanently. Your, your car stereo can break permanently. Uh, and hackers can even use their exploit to get access to your banking records, your personal accounts, and everything. There was a massive uh, um, uh, consumer suit against these guys, which was actually successful. I was an expert witness on that suit as well. Um, and they had to replace all the CDs, and they had to pay people back, and, and it was it was a big deal. Um, but you know, the reality is they they actually just hacked into people's computers, and and you know, my own car stereo, my, which was a Sony, was destroyed when I tried to play a Bob Dylan CD, which was put out by Sony, in that stereo. You know, and this happened millions and millions of times. Um, then I I love this. Um, last year. Um, some of the uh, file sharing traffic from BitTorrent was leaked and, and IP addresses of people who are downloading uh, TV shows uh, were made public and some of those IP addresses were traced back to the RIAA. So people at the RIAA are actually using BitTorrent <laughs> Isn't that so funny? to get illegal access to TV episodes. And by the way, these 60 episodes alone, and this is just from a, a tiny window of time, uh, are worth nine million dollars in statutory damages. Then this is the saddest story of all. Um, this guy Melchior Rietveld, who's a, a Dutch composer, got hired by the film industry um, to write the music for an anti-piracy video that they were going to show at a film festival. Now they did. They showed, it, they showed it at the festival and he got paid and everything was fine until uh, this is what the video looks like. Have you ever seen this video? It's been seen pretty broadly, as he found out when he went uh, to the video store and he uh, rented a copy of Harry Potter on DVD. He popped it in, and the first thing that he saw was the anti-piracy video, uh, which he was using his music. I was about to say, he didn't get paid for it, right? He didn't get paid for it. He didn't get permission for it. So he actually figured out that he was owed about a million dollars. And he went to the uh, Performing Rights Society in Holland, which whose only job is to track down money owed to composers for the use of their work um, in industry. And he said, I'm owed a million dollars. Can you help me get the money? He did not hear back from them for two years. Two years. And when he finally did hear back from them, it was a, it was a member of the, uh, of the, the um, Performing Rights Society who said, I'll help you get your money, but here's the deal. You have to personally pay me one-third of it you have to pay me $300,000. So he was being extorted by the anti-piracy anti expert who was, tr who was being asked to help him recover money that was stolen by anti-piracy people for an anti-piracy video that he contributed to. Um, fortunately, he was smart enough to call up a local TV program and they actually got the guy to repeat his, um, his extortion on air. And so the guy got busted, which is how we know about it. But who knows how many times this happens without people getting busted, right? So these are not good people. These people do not have the moral high ground. So let's talk about what happens. So that part of the book is all about why the whole argument, the rationale behind anti-piracy laws are just BS. But let's talk about why these laws are a bad idea beyond that. Um, I don't have much time to get into this chapter, but basically what I do in this chapter is I, I have in-depth profiles of five very promising digital music companies over the last 10 years, 15 years really, that having in very good faith tried to do innovative things and have been either sued out of existence or refused to be licensed by the major labels um, and, ex and held to the fire for tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, and none of these companies ever succeeded in developing any industry, despite the fact that they were all very innovative, very ahead of their time, um, and, and the, despite the best intentions of the people, even in this case, uh, somebody who worked inside of Warner Music, who tried on behalf of a major label to get something started, and even they couldn't get the other major labels to participate. So I actually called up this guy, Leandro, who was head of the biggest major label, Universal, uh, for all these years, 1997 to 2008. And I said, uh, I said, what were you guys thinking? 
um, you know, uh, we've got that sound again, Jessica. You might want to plug in your earphones. Um, it is. They are plugged, plugged in. in. Oh. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Well, it goes away when you talk. So okay. next time it happens, I'll just say, give us a high five. Ooh. So I said, Larry, what were you guys thinking? Why were you suing these guys when they represented your greatest hope for the future? And he said, well, the idea was, why license them and make a little? And the guy who was in charge of licensing at the biggest major label during the first decade of the 20th century. Wow. And this was not his personal attitude. This was him lamenting what the attitude inside the label was. He, according to him, he really wanted to license to these guys, uh, but he couldn't convince the label brass to do it because, um, you know, they were focused on the next quarter, on making their quotas. It, it got to the point where, you know, you had... Uh, as an executive, you had to make X million dollars over the next quarter. You had a much better chance of doing it by suing people than by licensing. Uh, say something again, Josephine. Hello. The sound. hello, hello, hello. Much better. But what I'm even more concerned about than the lost opportunity for revenues and, and for industry innovation is the lost opportunity for democracy and, and civil liberties. The RAA on their website actually claims that they're against censorship and for the First Amendment. This is a quote from their website. But as you'll see, nothing could actually be further from the case. And it really begins with their role at the center of a very large lobbying uh, infrastructure. So the RAA between 89 and 2011 has actually given $1 million dollars uh, in campaign finance and lobbying to the legislature of the U.S. government. The recording industry overall has given $150 million dollars. The TV, movie, and music industries combined have given $1.5 billion. The copyright industries combined have given $2.3 billion over that 12-year period. And even beyond that, if you just look at the last three years, 2009, 10, and 11, in those three years combined, almost $3 billion have been spent in the U.S. alone on lobbying alone on so-called copyright reform which only means making copyright stricter. Now, let's talk about what that actually means when the money goes into the government. Here's a great example. This guy, Bill Lockyer, who's the Attorney General of California, wrote a letter to all the other state attorneys general in 2004 saying that he was gravely concerned about what P2P would do to industry. And they had to get together to stop these horrible people. Now, Wired Magazine got a copy of his letter and they looked at the metadata, you know, where you can look at the, uh, the information about who wrote uh, a Microsoft Word file. And they saw that it was actually written by someone at the NPAA. So he had passed this letter on as his own ideas when he hadn't actually written it. The NPAA was the author. Why had he allowed them to do that? Because that year he had received $36,000 directly from the RAA in lobbying. Okay, this is, this is a quid pro quo process that happens. Um, you know, you look at an international treaty that, uh, that the U.S. is desperate to sign, to enact, to ratify at this point, like ACTA. Uh, the RIAA and the NPAA were brought on as ACTA was being negotiated as industry experts. And they were able to take part in shaping it. But members of Congress who are elected by the U.S., uh, populists to represent them were actually excluded from these secret negotiations. So this is a case where international law that's being pushed by the U.S. is being written by corporations, not by elected representatives. Another recent example is, you might have heard that ISPs are going to start doing the six strikes law, um, where they, they, they take a look at what you're downloading and they actually slowly kick you off the internet if you've been accused, not proven, not convicted, but accused of uh, violating intellectual property. Um, that was negotiated by, with the help of the copyright czar of the U.S., Victoria Espinel. It's an appointed position, not an elected position, who got together and had secret negotiations without any input from elected officials or from consumer interest groups between all the major ISPs, the RIAA, and the Motion Picture Association. And they hashed it out and said, even though we haven't managed to get any laws passed that kick people off the internet for file sharing, um, let's put the policy in place anyway. And obviously the federal government has a lot of influence over AT&T and Verizon because they can stop them from being able to buy Spectrum or to 
do mergers and acquisitions, mm -hmm. all manner of other kinds of regulatory obstacles they can throw in their way. Um, and so what happens is through these kinds of mechanisms you get this, this kind of circular process where they create stronger treaties, often under cover of darkness, and those lead to stronger domestic laws. But they also lead to even stronger laws overseas. And then based on the laws in the U.S. and overseas, they get stronger court rulings. And based on those stronger court rulings, they get stronger agreements in place to prevent future court rulings, just like the Six Strikes Law that I was just talking about. Based on those stronger agreements, they're actually able to create stronger treaties. And the cycle goes on and on and on under the guise of harmonization. That's the term that they use. There's, but they always make sure that there's one law or one policy somewhere that's a little bit stricter so they can harmonize everything up to that level. And then as soon as they've raised the bar, they go around re-raising the bar in pieces again until they can harmonize it to that higher level. And what does that mean in terms of what are these higher levels? Well, a great example is the TRIPS and WIPO treaties from 96, which made copyright terms longer, made copyright automatic rather than something you have to register for, and made it illegal to break, for instance, the uh, encryption on a DVD, even if you're doing it for legal purposes. Even if you own the content on the DVD, it's a felony to break the encryption on the DVD. That's from those treaties. And the US law, the DMCA, was a direct result of those treaties. And then, of course, the treaty said that copyright had to be author's life plus 50 years. But the U.S. immediately raised the bar to author's life plus 70 years after they had enacted the treaty. That's an example of how the bar gets immediately raised. They're also always trying to make jail time and financial penalties, penalties stronger and stronger. These are three recent laws that have done exactly that. I'm not going to get into this guy. Uh, it's, it's a good story, but I don't have time. Another thing that they're always trying to do is to increase secondary liability. That means, okay, maybe you didn't violate copyright, but you helped somebody who helped someone else to violate copyright. For instance, you told somebody where they could find a software program that if they download it, they could potentially use it to violate copyright. They keep trying to make that illegal. And they actually introduced an act in 2004 called the Induce Act that would have made that illegal. It, it didn't pass. But that didn't stop the Supreme Court from using, from basically pretending that law existed and using that law, uh, th that non-existent law, to find Grokster, which I was also a, an expert witness for, guilty uh, for distributing peer-to-peer uh, -peer software in 2005. Now, based on that decision, they're pushing international treaties like ACTA and uh, domestic laws like COICA that would, again, make inducement a standard. Um, they're also making it easier and easier for both the government and corporations to spy on us. And not only to spy on us, but to share it in from... Can you say something again? Hello. How's it going? Thank you. That's good. Okay. But not only to spy on us and collect information about us, but to share information about us without our knowledge or consent between governments and corporations. And these are several recent bills and treaties that have that specific policy integrated into them. They also are trying to censor us in many, many ways. And by the way, the UN has recently said that um, participating on the internet is a basic human right, akin to medicine or food or shelter or freedom from uh, violence. The ability to have free speech on the internet is a UN recognized civil right. But there's, despite that fact, the content industry has pushed and succeeded in putting in all these policies that kick people off the internet or restrict their internet access uh, if people have been accused of violating copyright. Now in France they have Hadopi, which is a three strikes law. If you're accused three times, you're off the internet. They have the same thing in, in England, the Digital Economy Act. Three accusations, you're off the internet. Um, they couldn't get that law in the US, so they did the six strikes agreement, um, which um, is going into effect uh, in, uh, in the spring of 2013. Um, and they're also, even more nefariously, trying to create blacklists that would essentially give either the, the Department of Justice or corporations themselves the power to say to ISPs, we believe that this website is infringing. You can no longer let American customers have access to this website. So let's say that there's one file, one 
song or one movie or one document that, or image that they believe infringes copyright, they can block the whole domain from every American, make the ISPs not let people have access to the entire domain based on that one suspected file on that domain. Um, and that has been put in, that's what the Koika and our SOPA and PIPA fusses last year that you may have heard of that were all about. And then there's all kinds of crazy stuff on the wish list that they wanted to, uh, that they tried to put forward, like getting customs officials to check our iPods to make sure that we uh, are not infringing and to educate us if we are found to be infringing. Um, putting um, code into uh, TV shows and radio shows that would prevent us from being, being able to do things like DVR them. Um, remotely disabling our computers like the Berman bill would have done. Um, making sure that ISPs don't have to worry about so-called net neutrality if uh, they suspect their infringements. Um, mandating that anybody who makes consumer electronics build in DRM, which if you don't know what DRM is, it's basically a digital padlock. So for instance, you would not be able to rip a CD onto your computer anymore because your computer would not give you the capacity to do it. Um, making the Department of Justice and the Department of Homeland Security be a private police force um, whose job it is at no cost to the content industry but only at the cost to the, to the tax owners to police us for content infringement. Um, making ISPs check their own traffic and filter out anything that they believe might be copyrighted. Um, and forcing anybody who creates television sets or stereos to give them the ability to tell you what can be sent out of which ports on the on the uh, TV sets and stereos. Mm -hmm. So for instance, not allowing you to connect a, a VCR to a TV. Um, can I ask a question? Yes. So for example, if um, I, when you're looking at cyber lockers, say I have Dropbox and I make it collaborative. Yes. Um, someone else drops a song or something that right. we're going to do a mashup on but we haven't done it yet. And so they drop the real thing in in that box. Right. Who's all liable in that situation? I am for holding it, the person who drops it in and Dropbox? Okay. All of us. Well, it depends. So right now the laws are very conflicting and very fuzzy and so are the, so is the case law, so are the decisions. So most of the people that have been successfully sued have been sued for um, making available rather than for downloading. But the problem is if it's in a public Dropbox folder and you're the owner of that folder, you are making available. And your friend who put it in your folder was also making it available to you. So you would probably both be on the line to get sued in this case. Okay. And then there's, there's the big kahuna. Um, which uh, is, is the, the biggest thing on their wish list, um, which is an internet kill switch. And they've actually pushed this twice now in legislation in 2010 and 2012 that would give the federal government the ability to just pull the plug on the whole internet for the oh whole American populace. Oh my God. <laughs> and, you know, if you look at what's happened in Syria a few weeks ago, in Iran, uh, very recently, in Uganda, in, you know, all kinds of despotic places, this is, what, this is not what democratic governments do. This is what uh, totalitarian regimes and despotic leaders do. Uh, and it's very problematic to give, I mean, you might love Obama, but did you love Bush? Would you want George Bush to have that power? Would you want, you know, Mitt Romney, who came very close to being president, to have that power, right? I wouldn't want, personally, anyone to have that power. I don't care if it's George Bush or Ralph Nader. Um, so, okay, big deal. So, oh, can you say something again, Driscoll? Testing, testing, one, two, three. One, two, three, four, five. Is it better? Yeah. Yes, okay. thank you. So the reason this is problematic, obviously, is because it will be exploited. Power is always exploited. And if you look at the limited powers that they've even had so far under the DMCA, Warner Brothers Pictures, for instance, has admitted in court that it doesn't actually check the contents of files prior to requesting that they be taken down. So they're willing to, to censor information on the internet without knowing whether they actually own it or not. Mm -hmm. They've admitted to this in court. Popular music websites like The Jazz was seized by the, DS, the Department of Homeland Security in November 2010. No charges were ever brought against them and it was returned to them over a year later. Just take wow. property taken away. Just taken offline. 
Imagine a newspaper getting shut down by the DHS with no cause for over a year. Right? The fact that this is music often blinds us to how revolting this is. Or take 20th Century Fox, which had a movie called Chronicle, which really nobody ever saw. But they were so concerned that it was going to be pirated that they actually filed a request with, uh, with Google and required that Google remove all listings to the San Francisco Chronicle from their search results because they were concerned that the San Francisco Chronicle was a violation of their copyright in the movie, The Chronicle. <laughs> So say something, yeah. So remember, the First Amendment is freedom of the press. The notion that these sites could unilaterally censor entire newspapers is really problematic from a democratic standpoint. Well, then you look at the fact, you know, Hollywood says, why can't we we get these stronger laws in the U.S.? You know, in in um, in Sweden and in Spain, they have these wonderful laws that you know, if if you are suspected of infringing. We can, we can get your personal information. You know, we can go to the ISP and say, we suspect this person is infringing. Give us their personal data so we can go after them. And they've said, you know, you know, in our own country, we can't get these laws, but they have these wonderful laws. Well, as it turns out, you know the WikiLeak cables that got leaked last year um, and, you know, Bradley Manning and all that stuff? Um, as it turns out, in those cables was, was proof that the U.S. had actually lobbied not only lobbied, but threatened at economic gunpoint in order to get both of those countries to enact those laws. Basically threatening to put them onto a, um, you know, uh, a most wanted list that would have prevented us from being able to do trade with them, would have crippled their economies if they had not enacted those laws. And then based on the fact that they enacted those laws, lobbied for harmonization to create those laws at home. And again, this wasn't done by Hollywood. This was done by the U.S. federal government on behalf of Hong That is very problematic. Um, and, you know, it's been pointed out by smarter people than me, for instance, Madeline Bunting, who's a uh, columnist for The Guardian, that IP these days is used more as a tool to keep the rich rich and the poor poor than as a way to, to protect creators or even, you know, creative culture in general. And if you look, for instance, at the number of, uh, of, of, of cases that have been brought by so-called trolls, a troll is a company that um, owns intellectual property but doesn't use it. For instance, owns the rights to a movie but doesn't distribute the movie. Owns a patent but doesn't build anything with the patent. The only reason they own it, their only business model is suing people who might violate their intellectual property. In 2007, 22% of cases, uh, IP cases, were brought by trolls. In 2011, that number went up to 40%, and actually I need to revise this chart because it was just announced last week, that in 2012 it went up from 40 to 61%. So almost two-thirds of all intellectual property cases that are being brought are being brought by companies that don't actually use the intellectual property, that only exist in order to sue people. That's the only function of the intellectual property. Now, there's also the, the, the problem that the DMCA has already been used in this past presidential cycle to illegally force YouTube to take down campaign videos by both the Obama camp uh, and the Romney camp, basically, basically censoring the one thing that should never be censored, which is communications by presidential candidates. Uh, and again, there was absolutely no legitimacy to these, to these DMCA takedown notices. It was just the censoring power of the law was exploited for political ends. So in my final chapter, I ask, you know, is democracy piracy, right? Can we stop piracy without stopping democracy itself dead in its tracks? And I open up by talking about this very interesting new religion that's come out, which is called copiumism. And it was actually invented by a philosophy student in Sweden uh, a year or two ago. This is the first wedding that ever took place in copiumism. It was earlier this year. And copiumism basically says that copying is a holy act. That sharing information is the highest thing that you can do as a human being. And it's God's will. And that the internet itself is holy. And this might sound ridiculous and bizarre and just exactly the kind of nonsense that a philosophy student in Sweden might come up with. But if you think that, you're not paying attention to actual religious history. Because if you go back to the dawn of Christianity and you look at the publication
uh, you know, for instance, Saint Irenaeus, who is a second century saint, um, he would write in his publications, um, you who will transcribe this book, I charge you in the name of Jesus Christ to compare what you have copied against the original and correct it carefully. So the issue of copying was a matter of religious doctrine long before this age, and it actually only stopped being a matter of religious doctrine when the printing press was invented. And copyright took over where religion left off. Because copyright said, um, instead of, you know, the reason that he was invoking Jesus to get you to, to copy correctly is because it was, there was no printing press. So every time you copied something, everybody who copied from you would reproduce what you had said. And therefore, you had to make sure you got it absolutely right. When the printing press came along, you could make a mistake because you could always print up a new edition that corrected that mistake. And so copyright became the dogma that decided how things should be copied. It was the right to copy, right? And what I would argue is, in some ways, copiumism is taking over, is taking the issue of copying back into the religious field and away from the legal field. Because in an age with infinite information, where there's no cost to reproducing it infinitely, why should anybody have control of the right to copy? Um, in fact, you can't communicate with that copy. When you write an email, when you uh, communicate over the phone, any mediated communication that we do is by definition copying at this point. Um, and that's very problematic. So you see all kinds of resistance growing to this. The fastest growing political group in Europe right now is, this, is the Pirate Party, which is a very dumb name, but actually a very smart political movement. <laughs> and they're in, they're in uh, over 20 U.S. states at this point as well. And one of the points that they're trying to make is that when copyright was first conceived of, when our country was new, it was actually conceived of as a balance of power against government power. Because using copyright, everybody would have their own power to publish, right? Benjamin Franklin, Tom Paine, all of the architects of the American experiments were individual publishers and they were able to remain individual publishers because they were able to control um, who was able to reproduce their works, right? They had a right to make those copies. But what's happened is that as individual um, publishers have given way to the kind of um, oligopolies of the film industry, which is now three major labels in the film industry, which is five major um, studios, um, what you see is their interests and government interests have aligned, and that balance of power has shifted to where you see the Department of Homeland Security and the Department of Justice actually doing the work of the Hollywood um, oligopolists and, and actually creating laws that hurt people and suing people and policing people and surveilling people and censoring people. Uh, and, and copyright is no longer working uh, as a check and a balance. It's actually reinforcing institutional power. And what you see is, is, is some, in, in the wake of these changes, some very strange stuff. Like, for instance, um, these two uh, people, um, Daryl Issa, who's a, uh, a strongly conservative, arch-conservative congressperson, teaming up with, uh, with Ron Wyden, who's a very liberal senator, uh, to actually try to fight against uh, the copyright industries and their overarching uh, controls. You see, um, you know the guy fox masks that Anonymous wears to signify their, uh, their resistance to uh, institutional powers of various kinds? This is not a bunch of radicals. This is actually the Polish parliament. And this is the Polish parliament protesting against the Polish president's efforts to sign ACTA, that treaty I was talking about before, into law, um, by holding up Guy Fox masks on the floor of Parliament. Um, now, it's not just about resisting. It's about coming up with other good ideas. And there are many, many good ideas out there. I'll mention a few. Um, there's what's called copy left, which was invented by this guy Richard Stallman, who's actually been emailing me the last couple of weeks, which is very cool. Uh, and he basically came up with this idea uh, called um, the open license, or the GNU public license is what he created. And that says that I'm going to use copyright law not to prevent other people from getting access to my work, but to ensure legally that anybody who uses my work has to make it available to anybody else to use as well, under the same conditions. Um, this guy, I love this guy, I, I met him when I was over in uh, Amsterdam a few years ago. He's a, a Dutch professor. He's 
published um, uh, extensively about using this. Um, this actually, it's a, it's a form of law that predates copyright by millennia, called an implicit. And what it would basically say is that you create uh, a song, a movie, or a book, you own it. There's no as intellectual property. What you do get is the temporary right to use it for money. And once that time goes away, a year, five to ten, whatever, anyone for money, or not money, but the only one who, and once you create something for a period of time, you're the only one who can get a living out of distributing it. And I like that idea a lot because it takes the whole notion of owning culture off of the table. So, sorry, Aaron, you, you dropped um, out a little then bit. There's the pirate. You dropped out a little bit during that, um, what, you, what was it called? Usufruit? Usufruit? Yeah, the usufruct. Basically, what the usufruct says is that um, you don't own a song or a movie or an usufruct. Yeah, it's not something that you own. It's not property. It's just culture. But what you do have is, in exchange for having created it and made it publicly available, you will get the exclusive right for a limited period of time to make money distributing. Nobody else can make money selling the song. Uh, or selling the movie. People can distribute it, but they can't make money from it. Only you can. And then when that period of time is up, it's in the public domain. And I really like that a lot yeah, because like it takes too. the concept of property off of the table. Yeah. You know. Um, and then the pirate party is basically, you know, <clears throat> for all of their um, pirate rhetoric, what they want in the U.S. at least is just to roll copyright back to what it was when it was first created, which is a 14-year term instead of author's life plus 70 years, which is a mm -hmm. functional infinity. Then these guys who I mentioned before, they came up with this great idea, which they call the Open Act, uh, which unfortunately hasn't been passed yet, um, which would create a digital bill of rights that would basically say no matter what copyright laws we come up with, um, we can't violate the right to privacy. We can't violate someone's First Amendment right. We can't destroy their property. Their bottom line is that we will not cross in the interest of protecting intellectual property. I think that's a very bad approach. And, you know, last, uh, I'll, I'll conclude by pointing out that, you know, the reason this matters, it's not just about music. It's not just about culture. It's not just about contemporary society. We are moving into an era where today, as I was saying, you can make the argument that you can't communicate without copying, unless you're face-to-face, -face, right? The, the mechanism of using a laptop is simultaneously communication and copying, right? There's no difference between the two. But it's going to move beyond the laptop. It's going to move beyond the mobile phone. It's going to move beyond digital information into the physical world itself. What do I mean? Well, right now, there's massive growth happening in the field of 3D printing. And within five or ten years, there will be millions and millions and millions of households where you can print out an object the same way that you print out a piece of paper. I've seen these things used. They're awesome. They currently cost like a thousand bucks, but pretty soon they'll cost two hundred bucks. And then pretty soon after that they'll cost twenty-five bucks. And basically, you know, imagine that you um, have an IKEA bookshelf and the shelf breaks. Instead of going to the store and buying a new shelf, you can just print out a replacement shelf. I think they have the maker right? the maker bots right now. I think they're just like a few hundred. Yeah, MakerBots are, are, are the cheapest ones yeah. out there, and, and they're very popular among the kind of geeky yeah, crowd. Yeah. And, yeah, let's say that, you know, like a button flies off your sweater, you can just print out a new button and sew it back on, right? So physical culture is going to become as replaceable and as infinitely reproducible as uh, virtual culture. And let's say that you want to make a model of something. Why, just stand in front of a, uh, of a webcam or a Kinect, Right, um, a Microsoft Xbox Connect connected to your um, to your printer and a copy object, first, right? It's able to copy us the same way you can sell in a few years, assuming they're made out of not complex materials. Then we get down to even the deeper level. We're DNA or bus and DNA. A few years after that, you'll be able to to sequence your own DNA at home using you know, a USB plug-in device or whatever the replacement for USB is at that point. Um, and we're already having massive battles over whether and how organic life forms themselves can be owned because after all, they're just strings of information. 
just G, A, T's, and C's in, you know, in a double helix loop. That's copyrightable information. And right now, g genomes are being both copyrighted and patented. What's it going to mean when your body is somebody else's intellectual property? And then there's the fact that machines themselves are getting smaller and smaller. We're entering an era of nanotechnology where, you know, already people have pacemakers, but what happens when people have smart blood cells that are monitoring, uh, you know, proteins and are, uh, you know, destroying uh, plaque and destroying um, cholesterol, right? Are we going to be able to own the operating systems that run these devices, or are they going to be owned by company? Will a third-party company be able to remotely turn off your pacemaker the same way that they can remotely wipe your Kindle? Um, these are not powers that we want companies to have. I mean, we don't want this to be a question. We want to know definitively that that's not a possibility. And ultimately, we may be entering an era uh, that some people call the singularity. This is Ray Kurzweil. He is a prominent futurist and um, engineer who has a very long track record of getting things right. And what he basically claims is that in about 25 or 30 years, machine consciousness and human consciousness are going to merge to the point where you can't separate them from each other. Basically, the same way that now we can't communicate without copying, in 30 years we won't think without copying. Our very process of being human will be indistinguishable from media and information. Now, that is a whole subject, a whole rabbit hole that we could go down, and I'm not going to say he's right or wrong. Um, but I do agree that that moment coming where distinguishing between online and now is going to be virtually impossible. The question, we want a handful of companies with the power to censor us, to surveil us, to remotely disable us, to criminalize us, to call us pirates for sharing, no matter where we go and what we do and with whom, in our most private moments, alone with our families, alone ourselves, a lot, do we want to go down the path of creating laws and policies that are going to invest organizations with that kind of power? If we don't, we have to change our laws and policies now because it'll be too late once we've raised the bar to the point where they can't, it can't be lowered again. So I think that Copiumism is actually a great place to start talking about what our value system might look like in an era of a singularity, in an era of ubiquitous 3D printing, in an era of nanotechnology, in an era of cheap and accessible, uh, you know, genomics. Um, so, you know, my concern really not just term is about this pure law or um, pointing out that this particular policy is flawed. You know, my interest is in preserving the future of democracy and, and really of the human condition itself. This is good stuff. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I should mention that the, the book, um, now, it's coming out in paperback and, and ebook in the fall. But as I wrote it, I made the whole draft available for free online. So you can read it and you can comment on it at piracycrusade.com. And actually, yeah, piracycrusade.com. And anybody who comments is going to get a shot in the print book. So, you know, I welcome your feedback. You know, it's interesting. I was trying to think of what, where are the cases, um, where this has already happened and what can we learn from that. And I think the things that come to mind for me are, I, I remember seeing several documentaries about, you know, clearly I think we're all familiar with how, how companies um, were patenting seed, you know, for farm. Oh, yeah. That's a great example. I actually use that example a lot. So, I, and I was wondering, you know, just your perspective on that because this whole concept of patenting life and then that that well, it's, it, a human right that we, we couldn't patent life per se and then well, um, it's, pre it's pretty sick so I'll, I'll, I'll sketch out the story a bit more so this company Monsanto which right. I'm sure you know about mm -hmm. so they came up with this um, <clears throat> this herbicide this um, pesticide called Roundup yeah and 
uh, the problem with Roundup is that it didn't just kill pests, it also killed plants. So they also came up with a genetically engineered plant called Roundup Ready Crops, Roundup Ready Soybeans, <laughs> Roundup Ready Corn. And Roundup Ready was engineered not to die when you sprayed Roundup on it. Right. Now, it was also engineered to die after one year. So you had to rebuy the feed every year if mm -hmm. you wanted to have Roundup Ready crops. Right? So it's basically, as one of my students pointed out to me a few years ago, it's DRM for life forms. Mm -hmm. hm. Right? So then... Uh, there was a there was a court case where a farmer had in his soybeans he had some Roundup Ready crops. He hadn't planted them. The seeds had blown onto his property from an adjoining farm. But even though he hadn't planted them, because he was not paying Monsanto for the, their intellectual property, he was found like and he, he had to, right? He had to pay them. Um, he wanted to continue. Josephine, you gotta speak up again. Hello, hello. Like a vacuum cleaner. Really? Yeah. Wow. Thank you. Um, so, you know, and, and there, there, there. Theory that months, you know, it's a collapse uh, hmm. theory. The reason that bees have been dying all over the place right. has something to do with uh, a Monsanto engineered pollination mm -hmm. system as well, right? So obviously, you know, and and you know, this is something that actually predates the modern era. Uh, you know, you've heard of the Great Potato Famine mm -hmm. in Ireland. Mm -hmm. um, a large reason why that happened was because um, a very diverse array of crops was basically thrown over for one species of potato, and then you know, when that species got, uh, you know, got hit by a famine, every farm in the country died and there was no food and, and, you know, millions of people starved, right? So this is a, this is a mistake that people have made in the past. It's not a uniquely modern problem. But what's uniquely modern about it is that intellectual property laws prevent it be, from being fixed easily. Mm. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> um, you yeah. know... That's so disturbing on so many levels. I, yeah, I, you know, I, I really hate being the bearer of bad tidings, but there is good news, right? There's the good news. There's all these new ideas about laws, policies, and even religions that can take a, a, a very different uh, attitude towards this stuff mm -hmm. and can lead us down a path that can actually, you know, I, there are tremendous benefits to sharing. There, th these new networks that we've created have led to all kinds of phenomenal new cultural ideas, social ideas, even political ideas. And, you know, I, I, not a week goes by that I don't say out loud, like, thank God for the Internet. I love the Internet. <laughs> I'm so happy it exists. I can't wait, you know, for a world in which, uh, in which we can share on every level uh, with the kind of ease and plasticity that the Internet affords us. I just want to make sure that we can still disconnect, that we can still have privacy, mm -hmm. that we can still have free speech. Anyway, I've got to capturing everything. <laughs> get <laughs> no, running, but Liza, did you have any questions or comments that you wanted to add to the mix? One, just really thank you for this incredible research and and the talk. I mean, I I I I have a list of things I want to go. Okay, I need to go check this out. Yeah. I need to go check this out. Um, it's it's just really um, even open. I guess my thinking process around parallel it Great. but thank you very much well I you know this is this is why I do it I'm, I'm really glad yeah. uh, that Josephine has asked me to, to, to talk to you and and I hope more people get to see the video too I, I hope so actually, too I'd love to see I mean I, I think it's really important for people to see that's why I was I wanted to yeah. kind of do a <laughs> redux and have it recorded and you know get it out there a little bit more I mean it's fascinating like besides what you know Liza mentioned like the breadth of data that you have behind it but just like the insights is, and um, are, are, are just yeah. fascinating and disturbing and you know so it's just uh, something that I think needs to be talked about thank you yeah. well I hope you guys will continue the conversation and help spread the word yeah yeah so we have we have the Prezi link 
Um, so I'm going to give that to everybody again and then with the video so if people, you know, want to go through it and have like all the different references that they can have that. But um, thanks again for your time, Aram. <laughs> You bet. My pleasure. Well, I and happy have, holidays. I have one other question. Okay, sure. Shoot. Your, your students and, and how do you how do you instruct your, your, your students or, or folks in um, being effective to supporting some of the ideas that were presented here? Do you, are you having an ongoing dialogue um, online somewhere or? Actually, um, I, I'm having a number of them. So I'm part of a, an online discussion group um, that actually puts industry people as advocates all together. It's going to hash stuff out. And if you look at my website at aram.samurai.com, um, you can actually see there's video of a recent event in New York called INET, oh. where the people who cre created the Six Strikes Law were on a panel with me and with a couple of other critics. Oh, wow. And we actually spent three hours just talking about this stuff. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. And yeah, it was, it was a very interesting event. So, uh, you know, this is basically all I do is kind of talk about this to people. Um, you know, uh, call me on the phone back, and, and, you know, whenever something public is happening, I people know. Uh, so, you know, the more that you put into the, your own research, own writing, um, you know, you can help change things. Excellent. Good stuff. Great. Thank you. Good night. All right. Thank you. Have a good night. Have a thank good you. night. Okay. Bye, Aaron. Bye, Liza. Bye. Bye. Bye.